Hello, I'm Greg, and this is the eighth and final video in my series on how to write Qbert from scratch in Unity 3D. We wrap things up in this video by adding the enemy's slick, which will toggle platforms back to previous colors after the player had already toggled them. We also added a color palette, which will allow you to have the color scheme that kind of goes well together and determines the colors of the platforms and the cubes that they sit on. I added a freeze ball, which is a green ball that hops down the pyramid, and if Hubert lands on it, it will temporarily freeze the enemies for a limited amount of time. And finally, I scaled the game a little bit by limiting the number of monsters depending on the level you're on, and I set certain enemies to only start appearing on certain levels. So in the first level, you only get Coily and Bad Ball, and then in the next level, we can add Ugg, and then the next level, we can add Wrong Way, and then the next level, we can add Slick. And I also add the Freeze Ball on the same level that I add Wrong Way. It just makes the game a little bit uh, progressively more difficult. And I left things where you can take this farther if you want to, if you want to add more enemies or if you want to add more difficulty, like increasing the speed of the enemies or uh, change the way you score, maybe add some bonus items or something. I leave that to your imagination to do. But if you want to see how we wrap this up, grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair and follow along as I teach you how to write Qbert from scratch in Unity 3D. So let's take a look at our to-do list. Um, I want to work on adding some new features. I've been doing a lot of bug fixing in the previous videos and not adding a lot of new features. Um, I think we might actually be able to finish up this series, depending on how long it takes me to do these things. Uh, the first thing I want to do is add Slick slash Sam. So in the original Qbert, Slick and Sam were creatures that hopped around and they they reverted the platform colors back to the previous color, essentially undoing the work that Qbert had done. And then if Qbert jumped on them, they just disappeared. Uh, and also green ball is like red ball, um, except that if you jump on him, instead of killing Qbert, it just freezes the other monsters on the board for a period of time. So I might add a green ball enemy as well. Um, and then, we want to implement the multiple platform flips on higher levels and scaling the difficulty by scaling the number of monsters depending on what level we're on. And the other thing I might want to do is actually configure some of the enemies to not start appearing until later levels. Like maybe on the first level you only get Coily and Bad Ball and then on the next level we throw in Ugg and then on the next level we throw in Wrong Way and then on the next level I add Slick. And, and so forth, um, just for a little bit of variety. Um, and also when we get to this thing here, the multiple platform flips, I'm gonna go out and find a palette of colors that I think would work well together. But first, adding Slick or Sam, uh, in order to do that, we're gonna need a character. Now, I'm gonna go out to itch.io, and I'm not gonna actually try and reproduce accurately the character that was in the original Qbert game, I just want to find something kind of cute that would um, be interesting. So I'm going to go into itch.io. There's a lot of free stuff there. And I'm going to browse assets. I'm going to filter by free. I'm going to filter by characters. And then under styles, I'm going to filter by 3D. And so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time being too particular, but I think this little robot character here looks interesting. So if we uh, go to this page, they are low poly humanoid robots. Uh, they're rigged and ready for animations, but I'm not sure they're gonna work good in Unity. We'll have to take a look at that. But I like this little guy here, um, especially since he's got some green in him. And in the original Coily game, um, Slick and Sam were both green. So I'm gonna click on this download button and you can donate if you want to, or we could just say, just take me to the downloads. Uh, but if you want to support the artists that made this pack, you can do that here. And I want the Unity package. 
So I'm just going to download that. And that downloaded it there. And now that that's downloaded, we can jump back into Unity. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to import that package. So to do that, we will say assets, import package, custom package. And we're going to go to the downloads folder. And we're going to want this robots unity package. And I'm just going to go ahead and go ahead and import all of this, even though I think we're only going to want probably this, this, and this, maybe this. But I'm going to go ahead and import all of it. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot there. And it put it in this robot folder. And I'm just going to move that into our project folder. And so if we expand that, We've got this, I'm guessing this is the guy we want. This is a prefab. If I drag that here, I don't see, oh, he's disabled. Okay, and you can see that his material is whack. Uh, if we expand this out, this is his mesh. So his material needs to be upgraded to URP. So we can go into window, rendering, render pipeline converter. We want to convert from built-in to URP. Material upgrade. I don't think there are any animation clips. Let's say initialize converters. And this is probably going to find more things than just that robot. But I only want to worry about the robot for now. So let's see. Yeah, I don't want to mess with our Qbert bubble image. Oh, I don't want any of this scoreboard stuff. Hmm, it's interesting. I'm not even seeing the robot. And just uncheck all these. Okay, these are the ones. So we don't want that one. We do want this one. I don't think we want that or that or that or that or that. Or that. So I think that's all we want. I'm just going to go ahead and... Click convert assets. Now, I think it is a good idea to save this somewhere before you do it because it could break the project. I have mine in source control, so I can always revert if anything gets broken. Convert assets. And there we go. He has now got a material that we can see. Cool. Cool. By the way, I will be having a link in the description to this package, and I'll be putting the link to my uh, Git repository that has all the source code for this project, including these models uh, that you can just grab off of my Git repository um, if you're following along. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to animate this guy. So I think I want to upload this model to Mixamo and and find a nice idle and jump animation that would work nicely with it. So I'm going to open up Mixamo in my browser. <laughs> you can see I had um, worked on getting animations for Qbert in the past. So we want to upload a character. And so we're going to have to go to our folder with our new robot model. Let's see, robot. Let's show and explore. Okay, go in here. I'm just gonna shrink that down a little bit. Bring back our Mixamo window here. 
and we're gonna drag round.fbx. Oops. We want that. Let's see, and we want that. Let me just drag this over. So we're gonna drag round.fbx into here. Hmm. So it doesn't like that model. I think I'm gonna to have to pull that model into Blender and re-export it using settings that Unity likes. Okay, so I have Blender open. We're gonna go with general here. We're gonna delete the default cube. And this is not gonna be a tutorial on Blender, but I am gonna show you how I would go about exporting a model from Blender for Unity. So I'm gonna delete that camera, delete that light, delete that collection. And we're gonna to go to File, Import, FBX. And I need to go to my um, robot file. And we're gonna pull in this round.fbx file. And there we are. And you can see he's got a skeleton you can see his armature there, which is not really what I want for this model, because apparently Mixamo does not like that model. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm just gonna export the mesh. Yeah, I think that's all we need. So we will say file, export, FBX. Um, and I'm gonna put in that folder again, but I'm gonna call this slick. Slick blender. And let's look at our settings here. We don't want empty. All we want is the mesh. We don't want the armature. We don't want anything else. Um, I think I want Z forward for Unity. I think, we'll try this with negative Z forward and see if that works. I think that's probably all fine. I don't care about animation. We're not exporting the armature, so I don't really think any of that matters. And let's just give that a, a shot. Export FBX. And that should have happened pretty quickly. So we'll bring back our Mixamo window. We'll bring back our robot folder. And we'll go back to upload character. And we'll drag this slick Blender FBX file. Okay, so it liked that. So we're gonna have to auto rig him. So let's say the chin is about here. We'll say the wrists are here. We'll say the elbows, he didn't really have elbows, but we'll say they're here. We'll give him his knees. And we'll say the groin is about right there. And I don't expect this to be perfect and I don't really care if there's a lot of mess deformation going on. I just want something kind of cute, even if it's cartoonish. So it's rigging it now. <laughs> and it is a lot of mesh deformation going on there. I don't really care. So let's see if we can't find an IDO animation that works. So I'm gonna look for breathing IDO. I think that's one that I've used before that I like. That looks pretty good actually. So let's download that. Uh, I think I wanna do it with the skin.
And there we go. We are downloading that asset. And I also want to find a good jump one. Let me see. Look under hop. <laughs> I don't think I want hip hop dancing. Yeah, this is one I um, had played around with with some other models that look pretty good. <laughs> yes, I think that's pretty cool. So we will download that. I think, yeah, I think that's good. This one I'll do without skin. All right. So now we can go into our Unity project. Let me close out of Blender. And we're back in Unity. And I'm going to copy those files from our download folder into Unity. So now we've got Breathing Idle and Mutant Jumping. So I'm going to create let me go ahead and unpack this prefab here. And we're not going to want this rig anymore. We are going to want the mesh. Um, but I think I'm going to bring this and I'm going to delete this too. And I'm going to drag this whole breathing idol onto there. I'm going to rename this guy to be slick. I'm going to unpack this prefab. And I'm going to rename this to be Slick Mesh. Okay, and we're going to want to, we're going to have to add an animator. We're going to have to add a rigid body and a box collider. So let's see. I'm going to put the, I just realized this is not parented to him. There we go. I'm going to put the, rigid body in the box collider on the parent here. And let's see, box collider. I'm gonna to wanna to move that up, move that up. Maybe we move that down. That's probably good. We're going to want this guy. We're going to put him on his own layer. Let's call this slick. Go back into him. Slick. Go into our physics settings. So slick will collide with player and platform. Okay, let me just see. If I hit play, he should fall and just stand there. Yes. Okay, good. Now we're going to want to go down to this thing here. I'm going to change this to slick rig rig and we're going to add an animator and we're going to need to create an animator controller so right here We'll drag that up there. And if we double click on that, we get our animator window here. And let's take expand slick. I guess we call it breathing idle. We will take this guy here and drag him into the scene. And I'm going to rename this to be slick idle. 
Okay, and let's double click this. Click idle. We do want it to loop and loop pose. Um, I think that's all good. Apply that. Let's go up and look at the rig. He's going to be a humanoid rig. Create from this model. Apply. All right. So now. We have this avatar here. Okay, and that is our default state. Let me just hit play and see if he doesn't breathe. I do believe he is breathing. We can look at it in the scene view. But he's moving. That will not be an issue um, if we have his position frozen with the rigid body like we did the other creatures. But for some reason, the animation is, is affecting his motion. Apply root motion is not checked, so I'm not sure why that would be moving him. But like I said, if I was to freeze his rotation or position, he would no longer be moving like that. It doesn't look like he's animating. I do see it moving here. but not here. That's interesting. Oh, actually I see I'm not using his avatar. Let's give that a shot. There we go, he's breathing. All right, so that animation is working. Let's add the jump animation. So we've got this breathing idol. Next, we want to use this mutant jumping. I'm just going to drag this onto here. And make a transition from here to here. We need to add a couple of parameters. So let's add, I believe it was a bull for jumping. And we had a trigger for landed. So this one, the transition will be no exit time, no fixed duration. The condition is jumping is true. We'll make another transition. We, oh, we need to create a landing animation. But first, let me just make sure that he will jump if I hit this. He's probably gonna, let me double click this and fix some things here. We'll change this to slick jumping. No loop time, but I think it will continue to loop if I don't transition away from it, we'll see. <clears throat> the rig is gonna be humanoid. We're going to copy that avatar. Okay, that should all be good. Rename this to Slick Jumping. All right. And let's just hit play. And we'll watch it down here in the game view. So 
he's idling. And then jump. Good, that worked. All right, so now we want him to land. And I'm going to create a new animation for that. So let's click on this slick rig. Drop down here and say create new clip. And we're going to call this slick land landing. Slick landing. I like that. Um, now for the first node, we're going to go back to the jumping and we're going to go to the last node there and copy that. Go back to our slick landing and right here we're going to click paste. So he's going to be in the jump pose when he first comes in for a landing. And then here we're going to go back to the idle and we're going to take the first node copy that, go back to our landing, and then right here on about the fifth frame, we're going to paste that. Okay. And I'm going to delete this. Oops. All right. So that's his landing animation. <laughs> um... We're going to want to move that here, do a transition from here to here. And that's going to be no exit time, no fixed duration. And the condition will be landed. Then we're going to go from landing to idle. And that should just be fine like that. Or maybe make that a second or three quarters of a second. Because it takes a second to jump from one cube to another. And so all together, this should be about a second. All right. So I think we've got his animations sorted out. Um, the next thing we need to do is script him so that he can jump. So first let's create a prefab from this guy. Go in our prefabs enemies and we will drag in slick. Yay, we have a prefab. Let's go ahead and collapse some of these things. Oh, we do want to set his spawn location. So let's go look at where bad ball spawns. Copy that. Go up to slick paste that and now he will spawn there so let's delete him drag him onto the board and there he is i think in the original game they either spawn here or here um we may revisit that later but that's good enough for now uh let's go into our scripts enemies create a folder and we will call this slick select um, our slick prefab as soon as unity gets done doing what it's doing and double click that go back into our scripts enemies and drag slick script onto there and double click that to open it up in the editor i'm going to go ahead and get rid of all this boilerplate Now, I don't want him to derive from mono behavior. He's going to derive from enemy base. And what do we want to override in here? So the way that Slick behaves differently from, say, Bad Ball is he doesn't kill Cubert. So we're going to want to handle colliding with Cubert differently. And when he collides with the platform, he reverts the platform back to the previous color. So let's override on collision enter all right i don't think we want to call the base class at all but let's go and look and see what happens in the base class actually we want to copy this code we probably should extract that somewhere but i'm just going to copy it and yeah, we want to turn off the jumping animation, trigger the landing animation, 
reset our jump delay. And we only want to do that if we're actually jumping. So let's go ahead and copy that. But then the other thing we're going to want to do, if we collide with Qbert, if we collide with Qbert, then what we're going to want to do is instead of killing Qbert, we want to kill ourselves. So let me go look at that enemy base. So I believe it's Quayley who actually has a collide it with Qbert function. Let me look at that. I'm hitting control comma. I'm typing in Quayley. This lets me search for the Quayley script. And let's go find our on collision enter. No, it must not be Coily. Let me just see if I can find Collide It with, there's Collide It with Platform. That's in the Qbert script. I thought there was a Collide It with Qbert function. Let me hit Control Shift F, Collide It with Qbert. Nothing found. I guess I need to create one to do that. But there was a Collide It with Platform. Where was that? Collide It with Platforms in the Qbert script. Let's go ahead and copy that. <clears throat> Bring that into our Slick script. We could, we could put this out in a helper function somewhere. In fact, I think I'm going to do that because I don't like duplicating code. And this really could be a static function. So let me go out to Unity, look at scripts. I'm gonna create a, I guess I can make it part of the board manager. Although it's technically, I'm just gonna call it helpers. Create C sharp script helpers. I'm gonna open this up. And this does not need to be a mono behavior. I don't know if I'm going to need any using spaces. And I'm going to have public static bool. Let me just copy that, paste that function. I'm going to call this public static bool, collide it with platform. So I am going to need a using statement here. Import that. All right, so this will return true if the thing we collided with has the platform component. I want to do the same thing, but I'm going to call this public static bool, collide it with Qbert, collision, other, and I don't really need, well, can't hurt, Qbert, Qbert. Actually, let me look and see where we do that. That was in the... Let me look at the enemy base. So this, this could be moved into that helper function here. So let's go out here and I'm just going to change this from an if to a return. Yeah, so this this can replace that code in enemy base. So I will say if helpers dot collide it with Qbert out var Qbert. Oh, I have to give it the collider other. And I don't think I need that. Looks like I can re invert this if statement. All right, so that cleans up enemy base. And so where Qbert was calling collide it with platform, I can, I can get rid of this, which is gonna give me an error somewhere. Looks like right there. I can say, if not, helpers collide it with platform. All right, now slick. Don't need this anymore. 
So if we collide it with Qbert, for now, I'm just going to destroy our game object in return. Um, play death sound and show effects. We might want to have some particle effects or something. And then we want to check and see if we collide it with the platform. If helpers dot collide it with platform other out var platform, then we want to call flip platform with a negative one direction. And of course this will only work if we have multiple platforms. So one thing I think we need to change in order for Slick to work is how we get our random jump location. So I'm going to go and look and see how Coily gets this random jump location. Oh, we definitely want to keep track of our facing. Um, we're not going to be doing always down. We don't care if Qbert's on a transport disk. And we're not jumping towards the player, but we definitely want to use this legal jump locations in the board manager. I think we're gonna have to add an extra parameter. So right now we have down only. So this would be like bad ball, only jumps down or coily when he's in egg form. And then this one gives us our up directions. And then this one is only if we're a sidewalker. So I think we need one that includes down, but isn't down only. So I'm gonna add a new parameter here. Because I want, I want Slick to be able to jump down and then up and then down and then up. And, uh, he can pretty much jump anywhere as long as he stays on the board. He's never going to jump off the board. So we'll say bool include down. And I want that to be an optional parameter. We'll default that to false. So we don't have to change any of the other things they're calling. So now I want to say if down only or include down, do all this. And then here, I only want to return here if down only. Otherwise, I want to keep going and add our legal up directions. All of this should be fine now. I want to see what Rider is recommending here can be converted to a link expression. Now, sometimes that can be cool. Sometimes it's just not as readable, but let's just see what they're suggesting. So we're adding to our range of legal jump locations, anyone where our landing position is not out of bounds. If we're jumping down, that's probably okay. Let's see what this one's recommending. Yeah, I'm not really sure that it's any more readable, but I'll just leave it like that. It shouldn't break anything. Let's go back into Slick. And we're going to override. Let me minimize this. Let me zoom in a little bit for y'all. Sorry, I didn't do that earlier. I'm going to override get random jump location. We're not going to call the base class. Um, we're going to want to keep track of our facing. So let's say our new facing is going to be start with our transform Euler angles. And then I'm going to save off our position because I'm going to be referencing that multiple times. And it's more efficient to just grab it once. And now let's see how many legal locations we have we can jump to. So I'm going to say var locations equals game manager dot instance dot board manager legal jump locations. And let's give it some parameters here. We're going to want to pass in our legal jump locations variable, our transform position.
Um, the next one is down only, that's false. Uh, sidewalker is false. But include down is true. Okay, I like that. And now we're going to get a random location from that list. So we'll say var location equals legal jump locations. Um, we're going to index into that by random dot range zero locations. And we're going to return location. But before we do that, we want to determine our new facing. So I want to do something similar to what we did with Coily. Like we checked to see if you know, when Coily is chasing Qbert, we check to see is Qbert below and to the left? Is he below and to the right? Is he above and to the right? Is he above and to the left? And we set our facing to be either be southwest, southeast, northeast, northwest. I want to do something pretty similar to that. So I want to calculate an offset. I think I'm just going to grab my whole vector three as an offset. So I'm going to say var offset will be our new position, position minus, actually it's going to be our old position minus the new position. Yeah, I think that's what I want. And let's do a switch on that offset. Switch on the Y. All right, so just like we did with Coily, if, if, if we're jumping down and to the left, so I want to say y is less than zero when the z offset is less than zero, that's down and to the left, then our new facing is going to be board manager. southwest. Uh, otherwise, if it's down and if it's down, it's got to be down and to the right. So I'm just going to say case dot zero. New facing will be board manager southeast. If it's greater than zero, so we're jumping up. Uh, when Offset dot Z. I think that's what I want. I might want to look at X. Let me look at that. Nope, it says Z. So offset dot Z is greater than zero. So we're jumping up and to the right. That's northeast. New facing equals board manager dot northeast. Break. Mm, I said break. It's greater than zero, but not greater than not Z is not greater than zero. Then new facing is going to be board manager dot northwest break. Cool. Now I want to see what he's suggesting here. Convert switch statement to switch expression. Uh huh. Ah, that's the new syntax. I guess that's kind of cool. So now we want to check if our new facing is not equal to our current facing, then we're going to do a rotate to the new facing over a quarter of a second. We're going to set the easing to be linear. And we're going to set auto kill to be true. And then we're going to return our new location. Let's go back into Unity, see if everything compiles. And it looks like it did. So now I want to go back 
I want to go into our resources folder. I want to grab our managers, game manager, board manager. Actually, that's not what I want to do. Oh, I do. I want to add for our enemy manager. I actually do need to add slick. So let's add one here. Go to our enemy prefabs, drag slick in there. Uh, what I really want to do though here is I want to go to prefab square platform. We need to add another color here. We'll do that bright green like we did before. So now it should be requiring us to flip it more than once. And I don't really need to do that to test slick, but uh, I want to see if he reverts it back to the previous colors. Let's give it a play and see what happens. Tough to reproduce this if I'm not getting any slicks on the board. Oh, I see an error in the console. I need to assign the enemy. Oh, that's why. Okay. So if we go into our prefab for slick. I never assigned his animator. So I believe that's going to come from this node here. Yep. Let's give that a test. Okay, I'm not seeing any errors. by jumping on the uh, transport disk. Come on, Slick. Okay, we need to simplify our testing here. So let's go back into our resources, managers, game manager, enemy manager. Let's remove wrong way. Let's just change all these to slick. So we'll get coily. Hmm. And slicks. He is toggling them. Jumping on. Okay, so it looks like Slick is working as designed. Let's go ahead and put these guys back. So we're going to have Bad Ball. We're going to have Ugg. We're going to have Wrong Way. And we're going to have Slick. So we have at it Slick slash Sam. We're gonna add green ball. Actually, technically this is freeze ball. So I, actually I don't wanna complete that yet, but yeah, we're gonna add freeze ball. So let's go back into Unity. And I think I'm gonna base freeze ball 
off a red ball. So it's just going to be a red or a green ball that jumps down the pyramid. And it doesn't do anything except if Qbert lands on it, it will freeze all the enemies on the board for a period of time and keep any new ones from spawning. So first let's go to the materials. We've got this bad ball color. I'm going to hit shift D and duplicate that. And I'm going to rename this freeze ball color. And we're going to change this to be green and change its emission color to be green. And that's good. Go into our prefabs for our enemies. Select bad ball, shift D to duplicate. Rename freeze ball. And we're going to get rid of the bad ball script from it. Uh, one thing I just remembered. So we have slick here. Um, it dawns on me that we're just destroying him. That we need to tell the enemy manager that he died. Because the enemy manager is keeping track of those enemies. So we need to fire this event and actually that's going to take care of destroying it. So instead of destroying that game object, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to disable him. And then I'm going to say enemy died, invoke game object. And it's complaining that I'm dereferencing game object twice, which it says is inefficient. So I'm just going to put that in a variable and we'll call that geo. <laughs> Probably doesn't matter, but it makes Ryder happy. Um, yeah, so now we're going to want to create a script for freeze ball. So go back into here and I'm going to right click. Create C sharp script, freeze ball, double click on that and get rid of all the boilerplate and I think the only thing on oh, instead of deriving from this, we're going to derive from bad ball because most of what bad ball is doing we're going to do in terms of how we jump. The only thing we really care about overriding is on collision enter. Uh, one thing I was thinking, I don't want to be duplicating all this code. So in our slick script, when we overrode on collision enter, I copied this code. And I think instead of copying that, I want to make that a function that we can just call. So I'm going to, I'm going to extract this by hitting control X. I'm going to go back into enemy base. Yeah. And so instead of doing this here, I'm going to create a protected virtual void I'm going to call it clear jump on collision. And I'm just going to paste that code in there. And then I can invert this if because there's nothing else after it. So then in on collision enter, I'll just say clear jump collision. And then in slick clear jump collision, which is in the base class. So now in freeze ball, I can call that clear jump collision. And then the only other thing I'm going to want to do is say if helpers collided with Qbert. Uh, let's see, other out bar Qbert. So if I collide it with Qbert, 
then we're going to want to add a new function to the game manager to tell it to freeze the enemies. And then the enemies are going to have to look at that to see if they're frozen or not. So we're going to say game manager dot instance dot freeze enemies, which doesn't exist. And then after that, we're going to set our game object to be disactive, deactive, unactive. <laughs> and then I'm going to call the enemy died invoke with our game object. And of course, once again, it, it wants to complain about this. And I'll just leave it like that. I don't care. All right. So let's create that method. So we now have a method on the game manager called freeze enemies. So we're going to want to introduce some variables up here. We're going to want to float. Uh, it's going to be a private float. And I'm going to call it enemy freeze countdown. And I'm going to add a new serialized field up here. Float. I'm going to call it free enemy freeze delay. And I'll default that to five seconds, not 56 seconds, five seconds. And then we're going to add a public property here. Um, bool enemies frozen. And it will be an expression body method that will return enemy freeze countdown is greater than zero. And we're going to want to decrement that in the update method. So first thing here, enemy freeze countdown minus equals time dot delta time. And so down in our freeze enemies function, all we're going to do is set that enemy freeze countdown to be the enemy freeze delay. So now we need to go into the enemy base and where we check if we can jump. So can jump, we're going to say if we're jumping or we're dead or game manager dot instance dot enemies frozen return false. So now no enemies will jump if the enemies are frozen. And then we're going to want to go into the enemy manager and where we check to see if we should spawn an enemy. Right now we're just checking to see if we're playing. And we can also say or game manager dot instance dot enemies frozen. And that should be all we need to do. Let's go into Unity. And we've got our prefab here for freeze ball. So let's go into our enemy manager. So resources, managers, game manager and we're going to want to add a new one here and drag in freeze ball so we got that um do we need to do anything else here i think that all looks good let's go ahead and give this a test oh i want to check and see uh, go into our prefabs square platform let's go ahead and remove this extra color so we only have to flip it once hit play i want to play maximized I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, you know one thing, that was probably Green Ball. And we never added the script to him. And I don't think we actually changed his material. So let's go into this freeze. Yeah, he's still using the old material. So we'll double click this. We want to rename this to be Freeze Ball. We want to change this material to be the freeze ball color. 
And then we want to add that script. So scripts, enemies, freeze ball, drag his animator down there. There we go. All right, that should do it. I think I'm going to do what I've done before. We're going to go into our resources, managers, game manager, and we're going to change all of these to be freeze ball. Well, we'll leave slick in there. And then we'll disable coily after he spawns. <laughs> Okay, there's Freeze Ball. Oh, but of course, with no other enemies on the board, I can't tell. There we go. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Yep, there we go. Okay, so that looked good. Let's put that back. Um, resources, managers, game manager. So we want bad ball. We want ug, wrong way slick freeze ball. Cool. Let's go back into our to-do list and check off add freeze ball. Oops. So the next thing to implement will be requiring multiple platform flips on higher levels. So to do that, we're going to want to get a palette and we're going to want to add it to our board manager. So right now the board manager is just managing the prefab for the squares and the transport disks. Uh, and the colors are currently being assigned uh, from the prefab for the square here on this platform. So I'm going to remove these and back on that board manager script, I'm going to add a couple of color arrays. I'm going to have one for base colors and one for platform colors. And those colors are going to come from a color palette. And you can get color palettes from a lot of different places. Uh, I kind of like this site here, pixelart.com. And you see there's a palettes tab here and you can filter the palettes by different categories. I'm just gonna search for arcade. And you can see there's a handful of color palettes. These two look to be pretty much identical. I'm just gonna go with this arcade standard 29. If I double, or if I click on that, it gives you the RGB values uh, and such for these colors. And you can also just download that image, that palette as an image. So I'm gonna click that, it's downloading it. And if I was to open that, you see I get this nice image right here. Now, I actually wanna store that as part of my project. So we'll go back into Unity and I could put it under sprites, but I think it kind of makes sense to go under maybe material. I'm just gonna create a folder called images. So I'll right click, create folder images, and we'll go to my downloads folder and drag that color palette image right into there. And then I can take this, um, I can take this image file here. I'm just gonna minimize that a little bit 
and I'm going to dock it to the right side of my monitor. And then there's Unity on the left side. Okay, so now what we can do is I can go into that prefab for the manager, the board manager. So managers, game manager, board manager. I can go into that script and add a couple of serialized fields. We will say color array and we're going to have base colors and platform colors. And going back out into Unity, we should see them appear in our inspector here. And there they are. So I think I want to have, I don't know, maybe eight. base colors and I want to use some somewhat muted base colors so let's start with this one um, what I can do is click this eyedropper and then click that um, then another good one might be that I'm just gonna go kind of in reverse order here on some of these muted colors uh, let's see maybe that one Maybe that one, and maybe that one. I think those would be pretty good for the base of the cubes. And then we'll go look at some of the platform colors. So I think I'll try to get about 10 of those. By the way, I had somebody comment on one of my videos and said that they thought I sounded like Dr. Demento. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but if you think I sound like Dr. Demento, let me know. I like to hear what you think. So let's see, I'll take that one. Then maybe I'll take that one. I like yellow. Maybe that one. That one. How about orange? Ooh, green. Kind of a lime green. Maybe a darker green light purple and pink. All right, I think those look pretty good. So I can go ahead and close this up now and maximize this again. And let's go into our board manager script. And we're gonna have to make a few changes in here to be able to work with this new palette. Um, one thing I know we're gonna to wanna to do, so we're keeping track of our list of platforms. We're also going to want a list of our um, I'm calling them squares, but they're really platform bases. So let's see, list of square, and we'll say platform bases. And the reason I need this is because we're going to be um, setting the colors on these things, just like we're going to be setting the colors for these. Um, and I want to have a couple of public properties. Um, I essentially want a way for the scoreboard. So if you've ever played the original Qbert, it has a little help thing on the screen that says change to, and it has a little picture of the platform and the color you need to change it to. So I want to have a way for the scoreboard to access our base color and our target color for this level. So I'm going to call this public color base color. And this is just going to be a property with a public getter and a private setter. And I'll have a public color target color. And again, a public getter and a private setter. And that should be all I need for that. Now, when we set up our board, we're going to want to, we're instantiating our list of platforms here. Let's also instantiate our list of platform bases. And when we create our bases here, let's go ahead and add them to our collection. So we'll say platform bases dot add, and we'll say square dot get component 
square. Alright. Now, what doesn't it like about that? Oh, it likes it. It just took a while for it to realize it liked it. Okay. And I want to add a new function. And I want to call it set platform colors. So like right here, we're in reset platforms. We're, we're iterating through all the platforms and we're calling the reset platform on the function. Um, I think I want to do that inside a new function called set platform colors. And I want that function to also set the base color. So underneath the reset platforms, I'm going to have void set platform colors. And we're going to assign our base color in here. So our base color, we're basically going to take our collection of base colors and we're going to index into it. We're going to use the level from the score manager. We want to subtract one from that. And we're going to do a modulo on the length of our base colors. So what that will do is if, if the level is greater than the number of colors in our array, it's going to wrap back around to zero and go start over, basically. And we want to iterate through all of our platform bases. And we're going to have to add a function to that class, that square class, and we're going to call it set base color. So let's say for each platform base in platform bases, we will say platform base dot set base color, and we're going to pass in our base color. And this does not exist, so I'm going to hit Alt Enter. Um, I think in Visual Studio, you can just right click and there should be something to uh, generate the function on that class. I'm going to Alt Enter Create Method. And it will actually take me into that class and create that method. And I'm going to butcher this class. I'm going to get rid of both of these serialized fields. We're not going to need these materials anymore. And I'm going to replace them with a serialized field so I can have the renderer. And we don't need on enable anymore because we're going to use set base color instead. And then here, we're going to take our renderer, grab the material, and set its color to be base color. And I'm going to go back into our board manager. All right, so we've got that. So after we've done that, we're going to iterate through. We want, we want to set a variable for the number of times you have to flip the color on this platform. And that's going to be based on the current level we're on. I'm basically going to, every three levels, we're going to increment the number of colors that's assigned to this platform. For levels one, in two, you're going to have two colors. So you're going to have your starting color and then your target color. And then starting at level three, so levels three, four, and five, um, you're going to have three colors. So you're going to have your start color and then two. And then every three levels, we're going to increment the number of colors probably to a maximum of three times. I don't, I don't think I want it to get infinitely harder. Uh, let's see, int platform levels, we'll call it. And I'm going to start at two because I want to make sure we always have two colors, your start color and your target color. And then we're going to add, and we're going to use the floor method. Floor to int because I want to round this down. And we'll take the score manager instance level and divide it by three. there. So I think that'll work for the number of levels. And then let's instantiate a temporary list here. 
of colors. Call it platform colors. And then let's do a for loop. We'll start at zero. And as long as I is less than the number of platform levels we calculate it up here. Then we're going to get the color that we want to put at that index. And we're going to have to do a similar thing where we, we don't want to go beyond the end of our array. We want to wrap around. So we're going to do a modulo operation again. But let's declare a local variable. I'm going to call it C. This is going to be the index into our array, our colors array. And we're going to take the score manager instance level. We're going to subtract one from it. And then we're going to add the index from our for loop here. So we'll start out at level one, minus one is zero, plus zero. So the first index will be zero. And then every time this goes up, it'll be one, then two, and then three, and four. But we're going to take that and we're going to apply the modulo against our platform colors dot length. So we won't go beyond the ends of our array. We'll wrap back around to zero. So platform colors dot add. And we're going to take our array of platform colors indexed by that variable we just calculated. And we're going to assign that to our target color. The target color is going to be used by the scoreboard to show that little help to the player to show what the target color is for this level. Now we need to iterate through all of our platforms and set that color, which means we're going to have to create a new function on the platform as well. So var platform and platforms platform dot reset platform. And we're going to add a parameter to this called platform colors. We're going to pass in that list of platform colors that we instantiated here. So that's on the interface. So now we need to go to the class that implements that interface. Actually, is there anything else I want to change in here? We got flip platform. We got this, which now takes that. This should be fine. Yeah, I think the interface is fine. So we need to go into the actual platform class. I'm going to use my little control comma platform. Double click that. And so it actually did add that there. This is what we had before. We Remember, we had a serialized field. And we had our platform colors. We're going to get rid of that. We still want the renderer and the sounds. I need to check and see if we ever applied our revert sound. I can't remember if we did. Now, instead of this just having the int platform color, we want to add a list. I'm going to make it a read-only list of colors called platform colors. And we'll go ahead and instantiate it here. We're always going to want that. Now, flipped, we have to use count and set a length because this is a list and not an array. Flip platform should be fine. So this is what needs to change. So the first thing we're going to want to do is clear our collection of platform colors and then add a range of platform colors using the array of platform or list of platform colors that was passed in. This is fine and this is fine. I think that's all we need to change in there. And obviously this needs to be count instead of length. And the other errors? No, looks good. Back to the board manager. Scroll up here. So at the end of setup board, at the very end, I'm gonna to wanna to call set platform colors. 
So we've got that there. And reset platforms. I don't think I want this if statement anymore because we're always going to want to reset these. And I don't think we need this for loop. I think all I want to do in here is call set platform colors. And this will take care of setting our base color and our platforms. I think that is good for the board manager. One thing I want to do before I forget, I noticed an issue when I was testing. When we spawn Qbert, we're decrementing Qbert's lives. And we spawn Qbert when we complete a level. So every time we complete a level, we're taking away one of his lives. We want to move this uh, into the Qbert died function. I'll put it right here at the top. I just wanted to do that before I forgot. So we'll jump back into Unity and make sure we've got everything configured that we need to have configured. Let me just take a look at my game manager. I think this is fine. Let's go look at our prefab for our square. So we need the renderer for our square, which is the cube. Let's go to the platform. I never did assign the revert sound, so I'm going to want to do that. Um, on the platform script now, we already deleted those variables, so you no longer see those colors that were there. So that should be fine. Let's add this revert sound. So I think I like that one. So you got that one. You got that one, Qbert jumps. That's when he jumps on a um, platform that's already flipped. That's when he's flipping it to the next level. I think this one will be good when, um, is it slick? I think it's slick that's turning him back the old way. So we'll go up here and then we'll just drag that Boeing 6 into the revert sound. Good. So let's give it a test and see how it works. Hopefully we didn't break anything. Um, and I just want to make sure that the colors start out with some reasonable default start colors and that they get toggled when Qbert jumps on them and toggled back when Slick jumps on them. So these are our new start colors. I think that looks pretty reasonable. And we're toggling the colors. That looks good. Until Coily kills Qbert. In Minecraft. Okay, let's see what Slick does. Um, good, he's toggling them back to the previous color. And then I can toggle them again. Alright, so to test the victory condition and going to a multiple, um, to where we have to flip it more than once, let's go into our resources, managers, game manager and let's get rid of all of our enemies from the enemy manager actually let's just turn off the enemy manager so no enemies not even a coily Be a pretty boring game but i want to make sure after i complete three levels that it makes me have to flip it more than once Actually, we'll be on the third level. Okay. Let's 
Let's do a little UI work. I want to show something over here that says change to, and I want to show a, a sort of a half version of this cube uh, that shows the target color for that level. So going out here to our UI and our canvas, um, one thing I'm going to have to do to our canvas, because I want to put a cube, which is a 3D object. If I want to put a 3D object on the UI, since this is a URP project, I'm going to have to use something called camera stacking. Um, so we're going to have to create another camera up here, a UI camera that will only render the UI and then I'll take the UI off of the main camera so it doesn't render it. Uh, but first I want to create an empty node here and I'm going to call this target color UI. And I'm going to anchor that to the middle left. And I'm going to want to add a text mesh pro. And I'll just call that text. And we'll say change to. And I think I want to use that. Arcade SDF font, we'll say size of 40, oops, 48. I think that's what I use up there. We don't want any wrapping. And in the scene view, let me go ahead and switch to the scene view here and expand this a little bit, switch to 2D, double click on this, grab that, and I'm just gonna move that It doesn't want to move very fast, does it? And I'll move it up to about there, I think. I think that's, well, maybe a little bit lower. Something like that. And then, like I said, I'm going to put um, a 3D object on here that'll look kind of like half of one of these cubes and I'll rotate a little bit to kind of face the camera. I think that would be cool. All right. So first let's work on the UI camera. So we will say right click camera UI camera and I'll move that up just under the main camera. And the render type for this will be overlay. And the perspective is gonna be orthographic. I think that's probably fine. So probably fine. For the culling mask, nothing. And then we'll add UI. So I only want it to render the UI. And then let me go up to the main camera and we'll just take the UI off of it. So we're only gonna render the UI from this camera here. And I don't want an audio listener on that camera. Okay. And we're gonna stack this camera on the main camera. So we're gonna to go to the main camera and we're gonna scroll down to stack. We're gonna hit plus and we're gonna add the UI camera. Okay. Now I wanna create a prefab for our target color UI. So I'm gonna create an empty object and I'm gonna call this target, uh, target color cube. 
and you know, forget about making a prefab. I'm just going to make that a child of this guy here and I'm going to zero him out. All right. And switch to 3d mode for a sec. Well, yeah, I'll switch to 3d. I am going to drag him out in front a little bit and pull him down a little bit like that. All right, and then I'm going to take from our prefabs, our square and make him a child of that guy. And I think I'm gonna to have to really scale this guy up in order for him to be seen. Oh, I want this to be on the UI layer. Actually, before I do that, Before I do that, I want to unpack this prefab. So we'll go up to prefab, unpack completely, because I don't want to mess with this. Now I will change this to UI. Okay, and then I really need to scale this guy up, like massively. So link that, drag him down a little bit, make him a little bit bigger. Okay, and then I'm going to want to rotate him. Let's see, I want to rotate him a little bit on the X to kind of face the player like that. And then a little bit on the Y, kind of show a little bit of the side. I think that looks pretty good. And then I'm going to want to scale the Y down a little bit on this guy. Actually, I don't want to do that because that's going to affect the platform. I only want to scale this guy down and then move that up. Yeah. And then you probably notice it's not showing up in the game view. We need to go into our canvas and we need to change it from screen space overlay to screen space camera. And then we need to drag our UI camera into here. Change his layer to be UI, yes. And there, now we've got our UI alongside our regular game and we got this cool little platform which we can use to set the colors for what the target color is gonna be for this level. So we need to write a script for that as well. So we'll go into our scripts, UI, right click, create C sharp script and we'll call this target color UI. Let Unity think about that and drag it onto that object. Unity didn't think about it fast enough. There we go. So get rid of all the boilerplate like usual. Zoom in. I think all we're gonna want in here is a Unity Engine. Let's add a serialized field, actually a couple. We're gonna add a couple of renderers. We're gonna add one for the base cube and one for the platform. Base renderer. All right, so we're gonna add a public method called set platform colors. We're going to take a base color and we're going to take a platform or target color. And all we're going to do is say the base renderer dot material dot color will equal base color. And then the target uh, let's see, platform renderer dot material dot color will be the target color. And that's all we need for that script. So let's go back into Unity. And on this guy here, we're going to have to assign those renderers. So the base renderer will be the cube and the platform renderer will be the platform. And the rest of the work is gonna be in the scoreboard. 
So let's open up this script here. We're going to add another serialized field. And this is going to be a target color UI. And in game state changed, depending on what state we're in, we're going to either enable or disable that guy and possibly call that set platform colors. So if the game is in the ready state, we just want to hide that. So we will say target color UI dot game object dot set active false. I'm going to copy this down to game start it, but change that to true. And then here we will say set platform colors and we're going to use game manager. I'm going to go ahead and cache this in a variable here. I'm going to say var board manager equals game manager dot instance dot board manager. All right. And then here I'm going to say board manager dot uh, base color board manager dot target color and I think I'm also going to want to do that when Kubert dies and then for the rest of them we're just going to deactivate it um, well, when the game is over, we can make sure it stays active. I'm going to just go ahead and set it to true. But, and I guess when a level is complete, we can make it true. Yeah, I guess the only time we really want to hide it is when we're first starting the game. All right. So we need to go and assign this in Unity. It should show up here and there it is so we will grab this target color UI and drag him right there all right let's hit play and see if we don't see this and see if it doesn't have the correct colors and there it is and it is correct let's go ahead and complete this level with no monsters Okay, it's not displayed. Why was it not displayed? I'm not seeing any errors in the console. Let's just go back into that scoreboard. Level complete, we set it to false. Oh, and here I never actually... Oh, what in the world is this? I doubled that. Yeah. All right, let's give it another test. So it stayed. And it looks good. Still looks good. All right. Let's go ahead and turn our enemy manager back on. So resources, managers, game manager, enemy manager. Just make sure that works. I don't know of any reason why it wouldn't. And there we go. All right. Let's freeze the enemies. Hop around with impunity. Bye, Coily. All right. We're getting really close to finishing this series, guys. Look at this. 
I haven't seen that coily jump delay bug in a while. Maybe it mysteriously fixed itself. I'm always dubious when bugs fix themselves. So the only thing that's really left is to scale uh, the number of monsters by level and um, levels that monsters start on. And I don't think that's going to be too difficult to implement. So let's jump over to our board manager, actually enemy manager script. So I'll hit my control comma, enemy manager. And I'm going to want to add a new private property called max enemies. And I'm basically going to say it's going to be two plus the level. So when you're on the first level, there will never be any more than three enemies. Uh, actually, I'm going to make that one because this isn't going to include coily. So two enemies plus coily. So at the most three enemies on the first level, and we'll incrementally add more enemies as we go. So in should spawn enemies, uh, right now we're checking to see if we're playing and that the enemies aren't frozen. We're going to add another if statement here. And we're going to say if enemies dot if enemies dot count is greater than or equal to max enemies, we'll just return. So we're only ever going to spawn a return false. We're only ever going to spawn an enemy if we haven't allocated our maximum number of enemies. And when enemies get destroyed, they get removed from this collection and then we can spawn more. And I think that's pretty much all we need for that first part of that feature. Let's just go back into Unity and give this a test. We should never see more than three enemies, including Coily, on the first level. Okay, there's two enemies. Three enemies. We shouldn't see any more until one of those goes away. Now we can get in well, yeah, now I can get another one. And there he is. Alright, I think that seems to be working. It's pretty simple logic to add. Um, the next part of that feature is going to be having some monsters not appear until later levels. Let's jump back into Unity. Actually, I'm going to go into the enemy base class. So control comma, enemy base. We're going to add another serialized field. It will be a protected int and I'm going to call it start level. And then I'm going to add a public property start level, which will just be an expression body method that returns that start level. I'm going to default this to level one. So by default, without changing anything, monsters can appear on level one. Now let's go look at their prefabs. So bad ball can appear on level one. That's fine. Coily won't even factor into this, but he'll default to level one. I think I want UG to appear on level two. I think I want wrong way to appear on level three as well as freeze ball. And then we won't add slick until level four. So it will gradually get harder and harder as we increase in levels. Now we need to implement that logic in the enemy manager. So let's go into our scripts, managers, double click on the enemy manager. 
And right now we have a list of game objects for our active enemies. We also have a list of game objects for our enemy prefabs. Now I think that we should have a collection of what enemies are available for a specific level. So I'm going to call this available enemies. And here where we instantiate our enemies, we will also instantiate our available enemies. And let's add a function to actually get our available enemies. So I'll add this at the bottom here, void get enemies available for level. And what we will do is we will clear our available enemies. And then we're going to iterate through all of our enemies and our enemy prefabs, actually. Just to be clear, I'm going to call that enemy prefab. And let's go ahead and get the enemy base off of him. And if his starting level is less than or equal to score manager dot instance dot level, then we will add him to our available enemies. Okay. I think that's enough for that. And when do we want to do that? We should do that when the game starts. So we will say get enemies available for level. And we're also going to want to do that for level complete. So when we start a new level, So when we spawn an enemy, we're getting a random enemy prefab. So in here, instead of returning this, we're going to want to return it from our available enemies. So we'll say available enemies, available enemies dot count and that is exclusive now if I coded all that correctly it should all just work let's go back into unity see if everything recompiles hit clear and let's give this a test So I should only see Bad Ball and Coily on the first level, and never more than three total. Oh. Okay, so Bad Boy and Bad Ball and Coily, and there's only three of them. Let's complete a level, and the next level I should start to see Ugg. I should start to see wrong way. I was pinned in. 
But it definitely seemed like that logic was working. And I have not seen this jump delay bug in quite a while. Well, I think we have finally reached the end of our series on how to write Qbert from scratch in Unity 3D. I hope you've enjoyed this journey as much as I've enjoyed doing it. And obviously there's a lot more we could add to this game. We could have the uh, speed of the enemies increase as we go up in levels. We could add more enemies. I'm sure there's some things I didn't quite match exactly with the original Qbert. So this is kind of my interpretation of the game. But I leave it to you and your imagination to think about how you can take this and expand it and, and take it a lot farther than I did in this tutorial. And I hope you picked up some good useful tips and techniques on how to write a 2.5D game in Unity. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment and I'll do my best to get back to them as soon as I can. And if you found this series useful, and I really hope you did, do me a favor and click the like and subscribe button because it really does help me to grow my channel. And I really do want to get this content in front of as many people as possible. So join me in the next series. I have some ideas that I'm kicking around. I've uh, posted a poll on my channel and it seems like right now the leading candidate is to do another classic game. So I'll probably put up another poll with some choices of what those classic games would be and uh, see what you all would like to see. So once again, thanks so much for tagging along and following me through this journey. I really enjoyed doing it and good luck on your game development journey.